All right. It is so good to be with you. I have to tell you right as we start out tonight that for as long as I can remember, I have been afraid of the dark. Is anyone else in this room willing to admit that still as a high schooler, you're a little bit afraid of the dark too? Yes? I know it's a little bit of a kiddish admission, but I have always been and still a little bit am afraid of the dark. Even as a kid, I was afraid of the monsters under my bed. I was that kid who um, I would stand by the light switch at night and see the quickest path to my bed, right? And I'd like survey the situation, stand by the light switch, turn it off, run and jump into my bed like as quick as possible, right? Any of you, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I've always just been a little bit afraid of the dark. And during the summer of my seventh grade year, this movie came out called The Sixth Sense. Yeah. And hear me say, this is not an endorsement of this movie, unless you don't want to sleep for six months like me. But um, the truth is, that in that seventh grade year, I went to go see The Sixth Sense with some friends. And it was my friend Lauren's birthday, and we were having like a lot of girls, and we were going to spend the night at Lauren's house, and we were all going to see this movie. And you guys know that when you're invited to something in middle school, it is a prime time to say yes. Right, because if you don't say yes, then you're not a part of that friend group for like a whole nother year. And so even though I've always been a little bit afraid of the dark and I was afraid of scary movies, I was like, all right, I can do this. It's Lauren's birthday. You're 12, like woman up girl. And we're gonna go see The Sixth Sense. I'm talking to all the personalities within myself, right? And so we go and we see The Sixth Sense, uh, me and my friends. And that night, we're spending the night at Lauren's house, which is like double bad. Because not only am I seeing this really terrifying movie, but now I'm gonna go spend the night at my friend Lauren's house. And so at home, if I was scared, I would just like sleep with all the lights on, right? But at a friend's house, you can't really do that unless you wanna like lose your dignity, you know? And so, so we see The Sixth Sense and I'm walking out in the parking lot, like, and here's the thing you need to know about this movie. This movie is about this little kid that can see dead people like everywhere he goes. Okay, it's super creepy and weird. And Bruce Willis is like helping guide him through his life as he's like seeing dead people, but Bruce Willis is like dead, it's like, you know, spoiler, whatever. Anyways, you're not gonna see it, it's fine. And so, you can IMDB that, you guys, you're fine. So anyway, so Bruce Willis is like helping him and he sees dead people and he doesn't know what to do. And there's all kinds of just like really scary scenes. But I wanna tell you that there were two that like really stood out in my memory that night. And one, yes, someone's with me. And so there's one of this little girl that's underneath his bed and she comes out and it might've been once or twice, but it felt like a lot of times throughout the movie that she like kept coming out from under the bed and she had this like box or like book with her and she would come out from under the bed like so weird just like hey you know this little kid and so like that is a worse nightmare of someone who's already afraid that something's under the bed you know I'm like now I see the person who's been under there and then there was this other scene of this like I think mom who was just like dead in a bathroom just like standing there like all weird you know and so I tell you that because as we go back to my friend Lauren's house, these things are like playing in my mind, like, okay, I gotta sleep here tonight somehow, and like, th I'm gonna have nightmares. Oh my gosh. And so we go back to her house, and I'm eating a bunch of pizza, and like, we're eating all these like gobstoppers, and we each probably have like a two liter to ourselves of Mountain Dew, because middle school is like a super difficult time to know your limits, right? And so midnight comes. And everybody is like, I'm gonna sleep here, I'm gonna sleep here. And I'm like, all right, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. And so I look around and a lot of girls are like sleeping on the floor and I'm like, I am not sleeping on the floor because I know that girl is down there, you know? And, um, and I'm not gonna sleep anywhere near a doorway because I know there's dead people out there. And so I sleep in Lauren's bed. She had this like big queen bed and midnight hits and everybody kind of starts going to sleep as if they had just watched like My Little Ponies or something, like nobody else seemed to be having a problem. And I'm laying there like, oh, and it hits me that I just drank a two liter of Mountain Dew and now I gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah, not good, 
you guys know. And so I'm like, okay, I can do this. Woman up, you know, you're 12, you got this. And so I sit up in my bed and I'm like, okay, I don't remember where Lauren's bathroom is. And so I'm looking out to find her bathroom and I see that it's like down this really long dark hallway. Yeah, and I remember that there were more dead people in a hallway, and so I'm like, there's more dead people out there. I can't go out there. And so I'm like, all right, well, I've got two options. I can hold it all night long, which isn't gonna work because of science, uh, or I can run to the bathroom and try to not step on either my friends or surely the dead people that are laying all over these floors, you know? And so those were like two like really bad options, you know? And so I'm laying there and then a third option comes to mind. And I'm like, you know, I don't think those are my two options because I don't wanna run and accidentally bump into a dead person and I don't wanna hold it all night long. And so I did what any rational person would do and I just decided to wet her bed. <laughs> yep. I was like, you know what, I gotta go to sleep somehow, I'm not risking this, and then I just rolled over, and you guys, I gotta be real with you, then I fell asleep. <laughs> and uh, I still feel a little bit bad about it, it was not the greatest of stories to exist in in the middle school hallway, you know, but I tell you that because, here's the truth, you might never have wet your bed on purpose or wet your friend's bed on purpose as a seventh grader, <laughs> but the dark makes us believe some really crazy things, right? The darkness makes us believe some really crazy things. And maybe you're not afraid of the literal dark, but my guess is if you're in this room tonight and you've experienced any bit of life, that you've experienced some darkness of some kind. And maybe for you, darkness hasn't shown up in actual fear of the dark, but it's shown up in fear of a lot of things in life. Maybe you're afraid to go to school, or you're afraid to interact with new people, or you're afraid of what's waiting for you after high school, and maybe for you that's been your darkness, is a cave of fear. Or maybe for you, your darkness is anger, and there's been someone that's hurt you or someone who continues to hurt you in ways that just really tick you off. And instead of dealing with that and working through that, you've just decided, I am gonna be angry. And that's your darkness. Maybe for you, your darkness is shame. And while you didn't come this week looking to necessarily get rid of some things that you've been doing that you know are keeping you from God, you've decided, I'm gonna stick in this darkness of shame and I'm staying in this cave of shame. Maybe for you, your darkness looks like loneliness, where you feel like you are all alone and you're the only one who understands what you're going through. Or you're waiting and waiting for someone to invite you to something and no one does. Or you're scrolling through Instagram and you're seeing all the people that seem to be having a great time with everyone else and you're wondering, why don't I have any friends? And your darkness looks a lot like feeling alone. Or maybe for you, your darkness looks like apathy. And what I mean by that is that it's not so much that you feel or see that you're in the darkness because you're so numb that you can't feel anything. And maybe this, weird, this year has been weird or some things have happened that have made you feel disconnected from yourself and so you've just numbed out so bad that you don't care about anything anymore. And your darkness looks like, why don't I feel anything? And I don't know what you showed up in this room tonight, but I know that every single one of us living a human experience experiences darkness. And at some point, all of us do. But the problem is, is that we live in a world of inspirational and cheery memes that tell us to just keep going and like, you got this. And some of us are like, I feel really scared. And that's not helping. And not only that, but we have a thousand ways to distract ourselves the minute something feels hard. You feel that lonely feeling, and it's no big deal. You can just get on your phone to feel more lonely. Or you feel that anger, 
And you can just play video games for seven hours until you don't even think anything anymore. We've got so many ways to distract ourselves and numb ourselves that sometimes some of us don't even know when we're in the dark. And so my guess is you either run from the dark, pretend that the dark doesn't exist, or maybe get swallowed whole by it. But I think there's something about the dark that unfortunately we often miss. Because when everything feels dark around us, when we have nothing left to hang on to or grip onto or depend on, that's when sometimes things can become the most clear. The darkness can lead us to the kind of desperation that allows us to experience God's grace and his presence in ways that we never can when everything is going perfectly. And I believe tonight, as we see this place in Elijah's story where he is in the dark and he is in a cave, that God will use his story to teach us about our own darkness, our own cave, and that we will see who God really is. And so if you have ever asked the question, where is God in my despair? Where is God when life gets hard or when things don't go the way that I thought I would? Where is God when I feel like I am all alone? We are gonna see tonight a man who asked the same questions and God meets him in a really surprising way. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're gonna pick up right where Mark left off this morning. And all week long, you've been following along in this story of Elijah, and you've seen him through a lot of high highs, and now he's in some low lows. And what I love about the Bible that Brad just talked about is that we see some people with some very real human emotions that help us feel like we are not alone, and we're gonna see that tonight. So starting in verse nine, let's see where he's at now. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. As you talked about this morning, when Elijah shows up to this cave, he's over it. He's emotionally taxed, he's spent, he's exhausted. And after being in a ton of stress, God provides for him in some tangible ways, through food and sleep, which if you ask me, is like some really good spiritual insight that sometimes all it takes is a nap and a snack, right? And then, yes, yes to snacks. I, am, I love snacks and naps. Yes, yes, okay. And so then, after the nap and a snack, he goes on a journey for 40 days and 40 nights, and when he gets there, he enters this cave and spends the night. And so here we find Elijah at the end of this journey, and he's in the dark, and he's in a cave. And God starts talking to him. And he asks him this question, what are you doing here? Now remember, it's not like God didn't know why he was there. But sometimes I think when, when Jesus or when God or when we see an angel ask a question, maybe it's more for the person on the other side of the question, right? Like, what am I doing here? And Elijah tells him, everyone's left me. I am all alone, and not even just my enemies, but my own people left me. Because I think he would have thought that his enemies would have left him, but now the Israelites have left him, and he feels like he is the only one left. And God keeps talking to him. In verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. See, this text seems to imply that Elijah is looking for God in all the magnificent, obvious ways. From inside the cave, weirdly enough, that he thinks he'll see God. Like in an earthquake, or in a windstorm, or this big, magnificent situation, and we do this all the time too, right? 
Like instead of looking around in the space that we're already in, we look around us to explain why what's happening to us is happening or where are you God out there? And instead, he's right here. And he doesn't find God in those places out there. He hears God in the dark where he already is in the cave. Continuing in verse 12, and after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. God didn't show up in the earthquake or in a windstorm or in a fire, but he shows up here in a gentle whisper, a calm, soft voice. See, when someone speaks in a whisper, you have to lean in to hear what they're saying, right? Unless some of you are loud whisperers in the room and my empathy and my heart goes out to you, when most people whisper, we have to lean in to hear what they're saying and that's what God wants. Why else would you whisper to someone? He wanted to be close to Elijah and he wants to be close to us and God said to him again, In verse 13, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he's already asked him that. So it's like, what's God doing? Is he totally confused? No. He's continuing to ask him, what are you doing here? And Elijah replied with the same answer that he had before, and he tells God that not only has he served him with everything that he has, but that it was the Israelites not even his own enemies who left him. And if you've spent one minute in high school, you probably know what that's like, right? Like it's not the people you know are gonna be mean. It's when a friend betrays you that the sting burns so deep, you don't know what you're gonna do the next day at school. And that's where he's at. It's his own people who have left him and he's discouraged by his own friends and he thinks He's all alone. And so next we see God telling him, go back the same way that you came. See, this is the only place that God did not tell him to go that we've seen so far. Everywhere else God has sent him, but this cave, God didn't send him here, but God still meets him here. And God gives him some important instructions of what to do next. And he tells him this important truth. I am not going to leave you alone. You think you're alone, but when you go back, there are 7,000 people who have remained faithful to me, and they're going to join you. And he reminds Elijah of this important truth. You are not as alone as you feel right now. And I just believe that there's someone in this room tonight that needs to hear that for you that you are not alone as you feel right now. And then I love this because right after God gives him the instructions in verse 19, scripture just says, so Elijah went. And so then he goes. And then he goes to do the thing that God has instructed him to do. But in this powerful short conversation that took place in a place that we would least expect it because it's in a cave and it's in the darkness and it's in the quiet. And I love this story because I relate so much to it because I don't know about you, but when I'm in a cave and I'm in a dark place, the last thing I want is a big old pat on the back and a cheery like high five and like, yeah, it's gonna be great. Because when I'm down in the dark, I'm like, this is not great. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I'm in a cave, bruh. Like this isn't cool. Like this isn't good. Like what are you talking about? And we see God get into the cave in the space with him. And I often do the thing that Elijah did. I look around everywhere else for where God might be instead of the place I already am. And see, I think we've got a very real problem with how we deal with darkness and our very real emotions around the darkness because when darkness shows up for us, 
When things get quiet, we don't usually sit long enough to hear God's voice. When your parents' marriage is falling apart or when you're being bullied on social media or when you pray for something to happen and it doesn't go the way that you thought it would, we are usually left with one of two really terrible options. And maybe you know what I'm talking about. We tend to think either God doesn't care about us at all or did God cause all of this? And if you've ever been in that cave... I know if you're like me, you've asked those questions. But we see here in this story that those aren't the two only options. God wants Elijah to know that not only is he here with him, but he has not left him in spite of what everyone else has done. Because while God didn't cause the Israelites to do what they did, and God didn't cause Jezebel to do what she did, he also has never left his side. He's still the same God. And at this point in this cave, Elijah has experienced the whole spectrum of life that you and I know so well. And that is that life is so good and life is so hard at the same time. But here's the thing, is that a life with God is not a life where we're promised to live through this thing without pain, because we will have pain. But it is a life where we never have to endure anything alone, anything. And this reminds me of another story about being found in the darkness and God being found in the darkness on the other side of the Bible. And you don't have to go there, but I wanna share it with you because I think it's so relevant to what we're talking about tonight. In John chapter 20, after Jesus has died and was placed in the tomb, Mary Magdalene, who followed him and knew him well, went to go look for him. And she went to go look for him in the dark. In John chapter 20, verse one, it says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away. See, she sees that the stone had been removed, and so she goes running to tell two of the other disciples, John and Peter, and they go to look. And when John gets there, he looks and he sees only clothes. And then Peter goes into the tomb, and he sees not only clothes, but the wrapping that was around Jesus' head, and he sees it folded up in the corner. But then Mary goes to look in the tomb, And she's standing outside the tomb crying. And as she goes to look inside into the darkness, she sees two angels sitting there. Remember, John and Peter had just been there and they didn't see those, but Mary does. And I just have to wonder why. Why does she see two angels? And the angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? It sounds so similar to the question we just heard God ask Elijah, why are you here? It's not a passive aggressive aggressive question, but it's a question that God already knew the answer to, so why ask it? But sometimes we do have to sit and ask ourselves, why am I crying? Why am I here? What's the thing behind the thing? Why am I hurting? And I have to wonder for Mary what the tears were about. Because this was a man who had healed her from demons. This was probably maybe the first and only person to not look at her like she was crazy. And she goes to the tomb and she thinks it's the end of his story. And can you imagine the despair that she would have felt as she runs to the tomb and sees that not only is he dead, but someone has taken him but we know that it wasn't the end of Jesus' story. And she looks into the tomb, and unlike Peter and John, she saw angels. And the more that I've read this passage and listened to other people talk about it, the more I've wondered why she saw angels when the others just saw clothes. And I just wonder if it was because she knew darkness so well that when she looked into a dark place, she saw light. 
Those of us who have known darkness and who have been freed from it see, darkness, see light everywhere we go. We see redemption in dark places maybe a little bit easier because we know that God can do it. And so when she turned to leave the tomb, she turns around and there's Jesus. But at first she doesn't recognize him and she thinks he's a gardener. And so she's like talking and having this conversation with the person that she thinks is the gardener looking for Jesus. But then he says her name and he says, Mary. And I don't know how loud his voice was. I don't know if he whispered. I don't know if he said it really loud. I don't know. But there was something about him saying her name that she immediately knew who was talking to her. And she knew that it was him. And I believe tonight in this room that there's some of you in this room that just need to sit in God's presence and know that he sees you, that he knows your name, that he knows every single thing that has ever happened to you. And he's just saying and whispering to you tonight, I'm here. Because sometimes it's in the dark where we hear God's voice the most clearly. In ways that we don't hear it when we're at our highest of highs. It's when we're at rock bottom, when we've got nothing left, when we're desperate, that that can sometimes be the very best place for us to surrender everything. Because then everything's out on the table, right? It's while we're in despair, while we are still sinning, while we are helpless, that is when God can do his most redemptive work in our lives. And it's then that God can pierce through the ice that maybe is around our hearts so that we can hear his voice clearly. Several years ago, I found myself in a season of a lot of darkness. And I didn't ask for it, but right after I had um, our son, I loved this baby boy so much, and yet I was full of so much darkness, and I didn't know why. And somewhere along the way in my head and in my heart and in just like my whole body, this darkness like would not leave me no matter what I did, no matter how many laps around my neighborhood I did, no matter how many like, you know, sh random shakes I drank or like sunshine, I, no matter how many sunshines I saw, it didn't matter, I still felt dark inside. And so finally one day I just said out loud to my husband, something's not right and I don't know what's going on with me, and I shared with some friends and with the help of them and some people in my church and my husband, I started to realize I think I need a little bit of help outside of myself. Like, I can't save myself. Like, I can't do anything about this. I've done everything I, I can. And so I went to see a doctor and got on some right medication, and then I went to see a counselor, and for those of you who have ever been in the counseling room, you know the terrifying walk to the couch, right? Like, you're like, oh, they're gonna, like, totally drill me, and this is gonna be awful, and like, blah. And so I go, and I have this attitude of, all right, like, I'm depressed, that's fine. I can deal with it, you guys know. Have you guys ever seen that meme of that dog with fire all around? And he's like, it's fine, I'm fine. That's me, like almost all the time. And so I'm walking in and I'm like, you know, the darkness is like everywhere and I just like feel it in my own bones. But I've got my notebook with me and I'm planning on like, okay, this counselor, she's gonna be great. She's gonna give me my 10 steps to beat depression and we're gonna do this, it's gonna be great. I'm gonna beat this in a week, woo. And um, I sit down and I'm like, all right, you know, she's like, well, what brings you here? And I'm like telling her a little bit and I'm like, so just like give me the plan, you know, like I'm ready. And she just kind of gives me this look like, oh, like, you poor thing. And she didn't say that, but I just, I saw it in her face. And, um, and she's like, well, why don't you tell me about your childhood? And I'm like, did you not hear what I just said? I'm not here to talk about that. That was a while ago. I'm here to talk about right now. And she's like, yeah, I know, but why don't you tell me a little bit about your family and growing up? I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, you're annoying, you know? And um, I'm like, I'm, I'm here for the 10 steps, you know? But I'm like, okay, I gotta like trust the process. And so I start telling her a little bit about my childhood and my family. And as I start talking about those things and some of the things that I swore I was just going to take to the grave and I never really wanted to talk about or deal with, I started realizing that there were some parts of my life that I had never really let Jesus into. 
some things that I had just boxed up and put in a corner and just hoped that they would never hop into the driver's seat, but here they were, and they were driving my car. I just hadn't wanted to deal with them. And so, as I walked through that season, God taught me something really powerful, and that was if you want to come out of a cave, and if you want to come out of the dark, you have to walk all the way out. Like, you can't just stand in the back and hope that it's going to somehow heal everything, or you can't just keep stuff on the surface and hope that you can just kind of kind of give your life over to God. you got to give all of it. And what I experienced in that room that's changed me forever is that before I had been going from death to death to death, like I thought just staying isolated and keeping things quiet and not dealing with the sin in my life or the doubts or the fears or the questions that I had was keeping everything good, but really it was just keeping me in the dark. And as I started bringing those things out to my friends and my church family and to God, as I started praying, I started realizing not only can he handle all of this, but he is a God who is so familiar with darkness. And darkness is not dark to God. My shame, my anger, my fear, my questions, my sin, God was big enough for all of that. And we worship a God who is familiar with darkness. One of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver, wrote these words that I've grown to love over the last several years. She wrote, someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness, and it took me years to understand that this, too, was a gift. See, the gift of the dark is that when we have nothing else left, when we finally admit that we can't save ourselves, that is where new life can really finally begin. New life often starts in the dark. And this is true physically too. See, if you think about it, a seed is planted in the ground in the dark. A baby grows in the womb in the dark. New life for us often starts in the dark. And we can experience God's presence in powerful ways when we say, God, I am in darkness and I am in a cave and I need you to come in here with me. I need you to get in here with me, and here's the thing. You don't have to walk out of a cave by yourself because God walks you out. And I don't know what you've walked in here with this week. I don't know what box of darkness you've brought with you, but I know this is true. Life is so good, and life is so hard. And here's what I want you to know. If you've walked in with some darkness tonight, not only are you in really good company here, but God is here with you. And he wants to bring you out into the light. Tonight I believe that you can name your cave because we serve a God who knew a cave too. He met Elijah in a dark cave and he came to him in a quiet whisper. He sent his only son Jesus who died a terrible death who wept real tears just like yours and mine at the grave of his friend Lazarus. We worship a God who died and defeated death in a dark tomb. And so, while caves are real, and while tombs are real, and while graves are real, and the pain that you and I will experience in this life is so real, they are not the most real thing. They weren't the most real thing in Elijah's story, and they weren't the end of Elijah's story. They weren't the most real thing in Jesus' story, and they are not the most real thing in your story. Darkness does not win over your life. Resurrection does. Resurrection is the most real thing, and Jesus died a dark death and then rose from the dead so that you and I could experience a free life in him forever. See, we don't worship a God of positive, cheery little memes. We worship a God who knew darkness and who defeated it. A God who was so familiar with darkness that even on the cross, Jesus cried out in despair. 
He knew every pain that you and I have ever experienced and he knew every sin that you and I would ever commit and the ones that you and I haven't even thought about yet. And while you may feel dark tonight, God is here and he meets you in it just like he was with Elijah in the cave. And with his help, you can walk out of your cave too. Because the same voice that spoke the universe into existence is the same voice that met Elijah in the cave. The same voice that met Elijah in the cave rose Jesus from the dead and turned water into wine and spoke through burning bushes. It's the same voice that whispers to you and I tonight that meets us in our very hard places and our very real questions and our very real grief and resurrects us. He still brings order to our chaos. He still makes beauty from ashes and he's promised to never leave you. God is here and he's as close to you as the breath that you breathe. And I want you to know tonight that I don't share this from a place of just doing it because I have to. I share this because I've actually lived it. And in this past year, I have seen God resurrect things that I never would have imagined. A couple months ago, I read an article in the New York Times that talked about how spring was this new season to ask your family and your friends if they're doing okay. And while we used to believe that winter was maybe the most depressing season of the year, the stats of suicide and depression are showing that spring is really the season where people feel the most despair. And while there are probably a thousand reasons for that, one of the reasons that this article talked about, one of their conclusions was that when people are in the winter time, they expect, I just gotta make it through the winter, and then when I get to spring, maybe the darkness will lift. And then spring comes, and the darkness doesn't lift. And that can feel hopeless and really scary. And I don't know about you and your family and your friends, but in me and my family and in my friends, this past spring, was so dark and despair covered over some dear friends and family members in ways that terrified me. But I also saw God meet them in the darkness in ways that I don't think he ever have met them in the light. And he resurrected some things that I thought were just done because God shows up in the dark. God doesn't need you to get your life cleaned up before, he, before you come to him. All he wants is to meet you where you already are. Maybe in the cave, and in the dark, and in the quiet. And whisper to you, I'm right here. And he died and he rose again so that you can live a new life. And that new life can start tonight. Revelation 3, 20 says it this way. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. So tonight, let him whisper to you and meet you where you already are and remind you that he is right here. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the ways that you meet us in the dark. God, I pray tonight for every student and adult that maybe has kept their darkness in a box, shoved into a corner, hoping that it will just stay there for the rest of their lives, that God, you remind them tonight that you are big enough for that that you are big enough to handle their sin, their shame, their questions, their fears, and their doubts. But God, not only are you big enough to handle, but you will crawl into the cave with them and meet them where they are. God, I pray tonight that you make us brave to name our caves so that you can bring us out into the life. Resurrect us, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.